Good afternoon. Sorry, this was a little louder than I expected. I'm Chris Farsi, and I have the privilege to serve as the inaugural Hicker Family Professor in Renewing Democratic Community. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Welcome to the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and for the second event of the Hicker Speaker Series entitled Disability Rights in Citizenship in the Modern Civil Rights Era. Citizenship has not been guaranteed to every group in society despite promises of equality and justice for all. Many groups, and including and especially people with disabilities, have had to organize and to fight to realize the full benefits of citizenship here in the United States and around the world. For example, while the Civil Rights Movement produced legislative gains for women, blacks, Latinos, and young people, people with disabilities were left out. And as one of our panelists, Professor Cantor, notes in the article ADA at 30, quote, it was not until 1973, with the passage of the Rehabilitation Act, that Congress began to address the rights of people with disabilities as a minority group worthy of legal protection, unquote. This despite the fact that people with disabilities are the largest minority group in America around 60 million, one that cuts across lines of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, geography, and class. People with disabilities have been, for most of American history, semi-citizens, to quote a concept from my colleague, Professor Cohen. Semi-citizens having to live up to all the responsibilities of being a citizen, but only being offered a fraction of the rights and benefits. Many of our panelists here have contributed to the field of disability studies in important ways that advance our understanding of citizenship and democracy. In fact, it is difficult to imagine studying and understanding citizenship in modern democracies, save in terms of disability rights. Today, here, we take on the challenge of better understanding citizenship and democracy through the lens of disability studies and advocacy. Our conversation will range in emphasis from an examination of the efforts to create a more inclusive campus here at Syracuse University, to an evaluation of the landmark American with Disabilities Act of 1990, to international treaties such as the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, hereafter known as CPRD. But first, I would like to introduce our remarkable panel. Starting on my far left, Brian McLean. Brian McLean was the first wheelchair bound student to graduate from his high school and went on to graduate from Syracuse University with a degree in broadcasting in 1969 and then earn a master's degree in sports administration from Ohio University. He is the former director of public and membership relations for the Syracuse Chamber of Commerce, served as executive assistant to state assemblyman Mel Zimmer for five years, who Brian told me was the first Democrat elected in upstate in a long time, um, was also director of parks and recreation for the town of Cicero. He served in the Mario Cuomo administration as assistant commissioner in the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation before assuming the position of assistant commissioner of the New York State Education Department's Office of Vocational and Educational Services for Individuals with Disabilities. 
Mr. McLean is known as a champion for the rights of individuals with disability. His advocacy efforts have been recognized by his induction into the National Hall of Fame for people with disabilities in 2000 and numerous other awards and recognitions, including a fellowship in his name here at the Maxwell School. And also including the George W. Arentz Award, the highest award bestowed, bestowed upon a Syracuse University alumnus. Mr. McLean currently serves as the president and founder of Paradigm Solutions. Um, and also I'd like to mention, I'd be remiss to say that uh, one of his proudest achievements, he coached a semi-professional basketball team to a sterling 132 and 37 record. Uh, and you know, due to his expert coaching on defense, like I don't know if you ran the 2-3, which is in the uh, Syracuse University tradition, but uh, I know that uh, he's particularly proud of his, uh, his uh, coaching. Uh, his coaching experience for six years. And I'd like to mention also in 2013, uh, Brian McLean, along with George Hicker, helped establish a legacy fund to underwrite initiatives that uh, have increased inclusion and opportunities for students with disabilities right here on the Syracuse University campus. Okay. Uh, next, and sitting to Brian's right, is Professor Arlene Cantor. Professor Cantor is a Laura J. and L. Douglas Professor of Teaching Excellence at Syracuse University College of Law, where she is also the Director of International Programs and Founder and Director of Disability Law and Policy Program, which is the most extensive disability law program in the United States. And if I recall, maybe the first. Right? Uh, Professor Cantor is an uh, internationally acclaimed expert in international and comparative disability and education law. She has authored nearly 100 articles and a number of groundbreaking books, including the first law casebook on international disability law, the first book to examine the intersection of disability studies, law, and education, and her most recent work, The Development of Disability Rights Under International Law, From Charity to Human Rights, published by Rutland Press in 2015. Professor Cantor worked with the UN Committee on drafting the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and has worked in more than a dozen countries on implementing the treaty. She has been invited to present before the US Congress at the US General Assembly, the UN Committee of the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and the UN, and the UN Committee on the CRPD. Next, we have uh, Paula Pacenti Perez, who is the director of the Center for Disability Resources. Her major responsibilities include the oversight and administration of all disability related resources and supports for undergraduate and graduate students attending Syracuse University and SUNY ESF. Additionally, Director Perez, uh, Pacenti Perez, co-chairs the University's Disab Disability Access and Inclusion Council and the Council on Diversity and Inclusion. Paula Pacenti Perez earned a Certificate of Advanced Studies in Disability Studies and is currently a doctoral candidate in the Higher Education Program at Syracuse University School of Education. Her dissertation work explores the intersectionality of race and disability status with a critical focus on how whiteness and white privilege affect the equitable delivery of accommodation and supports in higher education. Next, and to my left, is Beth Myers. Beth Myers is the Lawrence B. Uh, Tasoff Assistant Professor of Inclusive Education, Executive Director of the Tasoff Center for Inclusive Higher Education, and the Assistant Director of the Center on Disability and Inclusion at Syracuse University. Dr. Myers oversees Inclusive U, a model program for college students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Professor Myers has been awarded grants from the U.S. Department of Education and from New York State for her work with students, families, teachers, and school districts. She serves on the Fit Families Research Team for children with autism and vision impairments. Her book, Auto, uh, by, uh, Autobiographies on the Spectrum, Disrupting the Autism Narrative, won the Ralph C. Preston Award for Scholarship and Teaching Contribution to Social Justice and Education Equity.
Professor Myers currently serves on the National Down Syndrome Society Inclusion Committee and is the founding executive editor of the Journal of Inclusive Post-Secondary Education. Okay. Last but not least, we have Johannes. Johannes has taught law, consulted for various local and international institutions about disability inclusion and carried out several studies related to the human rights of persons with disabilities. In his book, Aramat, meaning correction, Johannes looked at blindness and social reactions and pointed out the corrections that should be made for the social inclusion of people with blindness. Johannes is currently working on his SJD at Syracuse University's College of Law with a focus on political representation of people with disabilities. And I can say from having read some of the chapters of his dissertation, it is an already excellent dissertation that I look forward to seeing in book form at some time in the near future. Uh, and I would just like to say this as a quick aside. I could not imagine another university anywhere in the country who would be able to put together a panel on disability rights and citizenship with this much talent that I just presented to you on the panel. Uh, so Syracuse University really is a special place when it comes to uh, disability studies and I look forward to our conversation today. The format will be a conversation among the panelists for around 40 minutes, and then we're going to turn and take questions from the audience. So I'm now gonna step down from the podium and join our panel in conversation. Welcome. And let's start with examining disability rights right here at Syracuse University. So Brian, I'm gonna start with you. You were one of the first disabled students on campus here at Syracuse University. Could you describe for us the physical and cultural environment uh, for a disabled student here in the 1960s? Um, well, when I first became an undergraduate, there really wasn't a program for people with disabilities. Most of the, the experiences were for people who became disabled rather than like breaking a leg in a car accident. Or some, some people who were temporarily disabled. But the thought of a full-time disabled person coming to school was not on the radar screen. So there were several of us who, um, who applied and got admitted so we were to come here and um, it was really a series of problem solvers. We, we figure out what the problem was. Like I used to have to enroll or pick my courses a semester ahead. So it's setting up the course, courses for the second semester, they would have put them. They, class in an accessible building, that kind of stuff. So really I used to always have to know a semester ahead what I wanted to take so they could do planning and how to accommodate it. So the university was more than willing, you know, to get me through. It just took a lot more planning ahead of time. And so they, the university, it was not a formal program at that time. It was just a series of problem solvers in order to get me through school. Great, thank you. And you had mentioned to me in a previous conversation that you took a lot of classes here at Maxwell because Maxwell had one of the first ramps that was installed on campus. And over the course of your career, you became known as Mr. Ramp, correct? That's correct. The first ramp for the purpose of access is still on the front of Maxwell, of the original Maxwell. So that was put in to get me in and out of the building. And um, so when they did that, they would move, like if I had classes in the half languages, they would move a course into Maxwell. You know, they had to plan that a year ahead. That was before automation and everything. And so then so they moved classes and, and other courses in the Maxwell building. And uh, 
So I know, I knew all the mice in the building. Right there, I, left. <laughs> I, spent, a, I spent a lot of time <laughs> in Maxwell. So um, that basically was it. Right. And one thing is that, so you spent a lot of time in Maxwell, and then later on, when the dome opened, I know that you've been uh, a loyal uh, fan in the dome, but you were involved in making the, the JMA dome accessible as well, correct? That's what, well, basically I was chief of staff of the assemblyman who helped put up, get the funding to build the dome in the first place. So then, so I got a call from a friend of mine who was a reporter uh, for the newspaper and he called me just to tell me, you know, he says, I just went over to the dome. He says, I don't think you're going to be able to get in. And they had no program of access to get you into the dome for a place to sit, that kind of stuff. So I ended up having to sue the dome, or sue the university, to return the money that my member got them. Which, which media loved that idea that that was not basically suing my own member, you know, for the right to uh, readjust the whole seating plan and program of access at the dome. So, uh, but it was really funny because a lot of friends of mine are in different positions, like reporters and newspapers. They would pick up, they would keep me posted on what to do and the word of fire my rifle. Thank you. So now I'd like to turn to Professor Meyer. So we just heard a little bit about the inaccessibility of campus in the 1960s and some of the work that Brian was involved in helping open up campus. So as, director, as executive director and someone who oversees Inclusive U, can you tell us a little bit about some of the current efforts underway to make the campus more inclusive, and in particular, how they fit into some of the DEI initiatives? Uh, okay, so that's actually a, a really great question. So when we talk about the DEI initiatives, we often leave out the last part of that because our plan is actually a DEIA, right? We, our strategic plan is actually DEIA. It's actually diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, and I think that that part is really important because uh, disability is often overlooked when we talk about it as part of diversity. Um, Paula, next to me, actually runs that part of the DEIA plan and the, the committee um, around disability access uh, and diversity. So, um, and she's going to talk a little bit about it, I think, in terms of uh, this issue around intersectionality. And that is that, that we see disability as, um, as an identity, right? But it's not someone's only identity. And that uh, Diversity is actually a really important piece of, of what we're aiming for on our campus. And when we're emphasizing diversity, we're thinking not, not just about um, race and, um, or, or gender or uh, class or sexual orientation. We're also thinking about um, disability. And we're thinking about how all of these um, different identities intersect because someone isn't just one of those things, right? You can be many of those identities all at once. And um, our vision, a part of that DEIA strategic plan is for our, our vision is um, for the university to be a national leader in DEIA. And in many ways, we are a national leader. Um, we have been a national leader for more than 50 years in uh, the disability field, but we have a long way to go. Uh, there are, there's much more work that we need to do. And you can see that really from this, this panel up here. Uh, we have, uh, I have some many, many esteemed colleagues who have done incredible work in the disability field for a long time. Um, it, you know, Brian's work around accessibility has been incredible. Uh, he's, he's led this campus really far to, to gain accessibility for students, particularly with physical disabilities, but also others. Um, Arlene's work, uh, it, particularly around disability policy and law, 
Um, I'm particularly proud, I'm going to call Paula out, but I'm particularly proud of um, the CDR and, and the work that they've done around dismantling barriers to access for students. Um, you might not know this, but at most colleges and universities, there's a burden of proof where you, ha in order to get access um, to accommodations, you have to prove, you have to bring proof that you're a student with a disability. And we actually don't have that at Syracuse University, and that's because of Paula's work. She has uh, really dismantled that system here. Um, that doesn't exist here. Students can get access to accommodations without bringing proof of a disability. Uh, and that's really uncommon in the higher education field. So there's a lot of ways that I'm really proud of the work that we've done. But Syracuse has been a national leader in so many ways and for a really long time. I want to take a minute to just talk about um, Syracuse University's history and our influence on policy, how we've been a leader in the disability, in disability rights and inclusion. Um, the Center on Human Policy has uh, recently celebrated its 50th anniversary. Um, it, it has done work on community inclusion. It was the first national university institute to hire employees with intellectual disability on their staff. Um, we created some of the first inclusive public schools in the nation right here. Um, in Syracuse, my kids go to that school. It's in the university neighborhood. Uh, we have the first disability studies program in the world. We have the first disability cultural center at a university, the first disability law and policy program. And I, you know, I think this is one of the reasons why I came to this university. It's why others come to this university. It's why we're sort of a standout um, and, and can be a leader uh, among our peers. But I think we also have a really long way to go. Um, sorry, did that answer your question? I forgot where my, what their question was even. That's great. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a couple follow-ups. OK. So one is I'm both impressed by Syracuse University's history of inclusion. But the first point you brought up struck me. So we talk about. DEI, but we don't include the A. So then my question to you is, why given the university's history with being inclusive, do we forget the A? Like, what, what needs to be done where that becomes commonplace, where we're always including accessibility and talking about DEIA initiatives? Yeah, it's a, it is actually a really great, great question. Um, and part of that is, uh, this, this question about who gets included and why, um, who gets left out and why. And even within the disability rights movement, there's um, lots of questions about who gets left out and why. And uh, this was a topic that just came up in the class that I was teaching um, I, in uh, this past week on Tuesday. We were doing this uh, discussion about the movie Crip Camp. Has anybody seen that, that film? Yeah, it's this really fantastic film about sort of the birth of the disability rights movement. And um, uh, this, this spectacular work that happened in the disability rights movement. We were discussing it in our inclusive design class and we watched the film and we were talking about kind of the, the start of uh, the 504 Act and how that led into the um, Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, these activists that were so spectacular, Judy Human and Ed Roberts and this work that came out of Berkeley at the time but then and, and how incredibly powerful it was. But then we talked about like who was included in that? And, and who was left out? And uh, these activists were uh, people in wheelchairs, people who had polio, people, um, you know, these disabled activists like stormed the Capitol building and did this uh, long sit in that was historic. And the work they did was amazing. But, um, and it was in the 60s and the 70s, but the, but who was, uh, and, and there were um, deaf activists and, and all these other people who were there. But the, um, one of the disabled groups that was missing were people with intellectual disability. And so the, the question uh, for the class was why? Like where were those people then? 
And the answer was in the 60s and the 70s, they were in institutions. They were locked up. They were in places like Willowbrook. Um, you know, they were in cages, essentially. And, and what was happening then? And, and Syracuse was a part of that deinstitutionalization movement. Right? There was like Burton Blatt and the Center on Human Policy and Steve Taylor and Wolf Wolfensberger and all these people um, you know, that, that were doing this work around deinstitutionalization. Um, and, and that led to uh, the, the closure of those huge state institutions. But, but people with disabilities are... Um, are still incredibly marginalized, right? They're still chronically poor. Um, they're, they're often paid still, subminimum wage is legal. Subminimum wage is legal to pay uh, people with disabilities in most states, including New York. So, so this group of people is, is still um, really pushed into the margins on purpose in lots of ways. And so, um, you know, inclusive you that we have here at Syracuse University, this is, this is the first generation of college students with intellectual disability. Um, there are people who 50 years ago were being caged here in the United States. Um, and the fact that they're now going to college is, is incredible, like it's really remarkable. Um, so, you know, we think about this as, as an opportunity, but it's really, we have a lot of work to do to make up for what we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So actually, I'm, I'm gonna stick on uh, programs here for one more second. And this harkens back to something that came up in our conversation in preparing for this panel and talking about the work that you have done and Paula has done and Brian and George have done to make uh, classes accessible. And I mentioned how that has benefited all types of students in my own personal experience, where especially going into a pandemic, uh, it was invaluable uh, that there were all these things that professors didn't have to do because they were already there because of the work of Inclusive You and CDR. Uh, and you know, just to tell kind of a quick story, um, I have a five-year-old and we went to Syracuse Taste Fest and he had to use the restroom and we went into the bathroom and there was, you know, the sink that's lower for people with physical disabilities. And my five-year-old went and pointed at the sink and was like, that's my sink. That's the sink for kids, right? So he saw that that, you know, inclusion of people with disabilities in this public space was an invitation for him. Right. right, that like yeah. people like him were also considered in these spaces. So would you talk about the programs here at Syracuse and how they help not only disabled students, but all types of students? Sure, the idea that universal design benefits everyone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the idea around universal design is really um, designing from the outset for the maximum diversity of users. So if we can design something with the maximum diversity in mind, instead of trying to retrofit it, it's really better for everyone, right? And that same idea applies to um, our classrooms, right? Universal design for learning, the same idea. It's not just if instead of retrofitting our buildings with ramps, if we built them with ramps in the first place, everything would be better for everyone because it's not just Brian who needs a ramp, but I can use a ramp when I'm pulling things in with a cart or pushing a stroller or taking my bike or, right, there's a million other reasons why you might use a ramp. Um, everyone can use a ramp, but not everyone can use the stairs. So. There's lots of different ways that we can think about that. The same ideas apply to our classrooms, right? If I can make things more universally accessible to everyone, it benefits everyone. Um, and there's lots of different ways that we can do that in our classrooms. Paula can talk about this at length as well. But if I can design my teaching from the outset for lots of different kinds of uh, learners, then it really benefits everybody. And we've had lots of professors say, 
oh, I did this one thing to accommodate an inclusive youth student in the class and actually realized that half the class used it, it didn't actually hurt the class in any way, it was beneficial for everyone, and I decided to just keep it going forward. I put it in the syllabus, it was great for everybody. So, uh, um, you know, it's something that we've learned that can really benefit everyone on the campus. Great, right. thank you. Uh, Paula, would you or anyone else on the panel like to uh, expound on these issues about certain programs or policies at Syracuse that um, have been adopted over the years that have made the campus more inclusive? Sure, sure. Uh, I'm going to add, though, that you know the questions that I were given were not this, so no notes here, right? Yeah, no. Like, uh, <laughs> this, this, this is the danger of putting a professor in charge we're of going, yeah, moderating yeah. Yeah. Right. That, like, off, there's a lot of off script. Off yeah. script, right. So uh, actually, I, I'll, I'll start with um, why I came to Syracuse in, in 2014. So, right. so coming up to central New York, never in my wildest dreams would I think I would live in central New York, mostly because of the weather, and I still talk about the weather today. Um, my kids make fun of me because I'm obsessed about the weather. Um, I think Brian and I were having a conversation about the weather before we started, and, and somebody talks snow next week, which is just not happening. <laughs> Um, but, um, but one of the reasons why I came was because of Syracuse University's history around disability um, and disability rights. Um, I came from a community college and um, the marginalization of disability, the field of disability, is, is pronounced within um, most colleges um, and specifically, you know, definitely within community colleges. And having an opportunity to come here and really um, be able to enact, uh, you know, some progressive, uh, you know, changes, it, I was only um, kind of extending the, the work and the legacy that, that was here. I remember my, one of my first earliest engagements was having lunch with Arlene Cantor and, you know, and, and knowing about the task force in 2007 and you know pointing to that and then we had the um, you know the the the, the first sit-ins in in uh, the college I always say college body in 2014 and 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 elevating and activism around disability was really um, was really refreshing and um, to speak to sort of this flip to the pandemic, I want to actually point to Brian and Brian McLean and his relationship with George Hicker because it was through his relationship and his saying, put your money where your mouth is to his friends who have deep pockets, that we were able to um, purchase a, a system that completely automated our ability to sort of engage with students. It was a multi-year project and by the and we literally finished our last module um, in that spring semester in the fall semester of fall of 19 I know pre-pandemic but so when we were able to go online that ability to continue to engage and deliver um, resources and facilitate accommodations was was still there and and that points to the reducing of barriers, right? Reducing disability management. When we talk about disability management, we're talking about what Brian had to do, right? And those connections with, with it was, you know, his sheer personality and sheer, um, you know, relationships where his friends are carrying him up the stairs to the classrooms and things like that. There wasn't policy, there wasn't legislation there. We have it now, but, but, um, it, you know, the ADA, and I'm not going to speak for Arlene because she's going to give a, a whole piece to this, but students have to ask, right? And it's only through their asking, right, managing disability, right, that they, they have access, right? Um, and so one of the ways that we reduce some of these burdens is adopting a model that really centers the student's lived experience and how they articulate. Um, you know the the barriers in their living in their learning environments, and so we we take that at the center of, of the conversation, um, and not make that third party documentation um, a barrier. Great, thanks. And uh, I'm going to continue to go off script because I like where this conversation is going, and I, I want to hear from Johannes. Uh, so we heard a little bit about Brian's experience in the 1960s being a student on campus. Johannes, what has been your experience here on campus? Uh, well, my experience is, to be honest, a bit different because uh, when I uh, did my undergrad, 
uh, there was no accessibility measure at all. You know, I was able to learn just like with the help of a uh, human reader uh, and just like with the help of some uh, maybe assistive technology, but like the, uh, they were produced or they were like uh, given to me from family members or like from other organizations. Otherwise, my university was not, you know, able to provide uh, this kind of uh, accessibility materials, assistive technology for persons with uh, blindness back home. But, you know, for masters, when I, come to, when I came to Syracuse University, uh, that was really, really, really different experience because here, you know, um, each disability type is considered, you know, for example, we see ramps for those who use wheelchair. You know, you see here, for example, braille writings engraved uh, in, I mean, on each classroom. It's, it was my first experience, it was very interesting. And because of this, I was able to enjoy more independence than I did back home, you know? So it was really, really amazing. And, you know, I was like wishing that, oh my gosh, I wish so many people from my country could come here and learn this experience and then, you know, import this wonderful experience to my country, you see? So it was really, really interesting. And usually, you know, even through two surprise, uh, after my master's here, I went back home and, you know, whenever I give some trainings about disability law, disability rights, my example was Syracuse University, you know, because here each, 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 each uh, thing, I mean, each disability is considered, so uh, the accessibility measures are really amazing, uh, you know, they are able to declare independence of uh, each uh, person with disability, student with disability. So, you know, I was like pushing my uh, universities back home to model Syracuse University. So the experience was really, really incredibly amazing. Great. Thank you so much, Johannes. Uh, now I want to turn, uh, if I can, to Professor Cantor. Uh, one thing that Johannes mentioned that struck me, and it came across in a lot of the readings from disability studies, is that goal of independence, right? Being able to navigate spaces independently. Can you tell us about uh, or give us an evaluation of the landmark American with Disabilities Act of 1990 and uh, how that helped foster the goal of independence, where it succeeded, where it failed? Sure. Um, I just want to say thank you for doing this, first of all. I think this is such an important conversation. We should probably be doing it together with many other people on campus who are experts as well, who could be sitting up here every month. Um, and I also want to say how thankful I am to have been at Syracuse. This is my 35th year. I came because Steve Taylor at the Center of Human Policy had been an expert in a case I was bringing in Washington, D.C. to get people out of institutions. And he said, you know, do you ever think of academia? And I said, yes, um, okay, and I signed on here um, because of that history. And I have to say the history has succeeded in becoming the present. I think we do have a lot of work to do, but I think we can also be proud of so many accomplishments. And that's true of the ADA too. The ADA we can be very proud about. Okay, it has a lot of really important points. It was the first civil rights law for people with disabilities. But if you stop for a minute and think, how come it took until 1990 for Congress to pass a law that declared people with disabilities are entitled to equal rights, it's embarrassing at the very least. Now, there was a law we mentioned in 1973, and Crip Camp is a film, if you haven't seen it, anyone here, don't let the weekend go by without seeing it. Get it on Netflix and watch it. Why? Because we'll all be so embarrassed. We are embarrassed how little we knew about the history of disability policy. But there you'll hear about the demonstrations that were waged by people with disabilities, taking their bodies, throwing it in Congress, on the stairs in Congress, in Capitol Hill, to get regulations written for what was then the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And I'll plug here the fact that the, that law was the first disability law, but it covered only programs that received federal money. So as I asked my students, does it cover SU? 
What do the students think? Is there federal money involved in SU? You bet. They're called student loans. They're called grants. So since 1973, Syracuse had an obligation not to discriminate and to provide accommodations. But it really wasn't until 1990 with the ADA that people became aware of disability as a civil rights issue. Why? Because prior to that time, as Beth, the Professor Myers mentioned, prior to that time, people with disabilities were seen as medical problems as charitable causes, but not as human beings entitled to equal rights and dignity. And that's what the ADA is trying to do. And I say it's trying to do because it's still a process. It's accomplished a lot. It prohibits discrimination. But I also share, and you would ask me to share some of the flaws. And I write a lot about, I have to be, I mean, we have to be a little critical, right? It's not over yet at all. Why? Because people with disabilities are the largest minority in the US and in the world. And we can all become disabled if we live long enough, right? So it's not a question of putting them aside and thinking, quote, with their rights. It's about how we want a society that's inclusive of everyone. And I think there are three major concerns that I wanted to mention today about the ADA. Number one, it relies on voluntary compliance. What do I mean? Brian said it. He tried to get into buildings. He tried to get into the dome. It wasn't accessible then, and let's fast forward now, if there's a building that's not accessible, what's the remedy if the builder says too bad, if the university says I'm sorry? The remedy is to go to court to sue. How many people here have brought a lawsuit? Right, it's hard, it's tough, it's kind of something you want to avoid. Why? Finding a lawyer is not easy. It is true that there's a law here, and I have to say when I worked in Washington, this was a lot of what I worked on. It's something called the Protection and Advocacy Act, which guarantees people with disabilities access to a lawyer in every state in the country. Federally funded program for lawyers, for people with disabilities, no matter what your income, in every state. In New York, it's, it's in Albany. It used to be a grant here, but now it's all in Albany. But you've got to know that. You've got to know you can get a lawyer. And, you have to, and if you don't know that, you may have to hire a lawyer and pay. And then you have to go to court. And then you have to prove you're a person with a disability in order to get into court. And you have to prove your cause of action. And then you have to have experts. And then it's years later where there's a resolution. And all you wanted to do, maybe, was to get into an ice cream store to get an ice cream cone that summer. But there was a step, and you couldn't get in. That was a case we brought here, actually, against when Marshall Street had a Baskin Robbins. It was a step. Julia, Professor White over there is shaking her head. And we had a plaintiff named Michael Kennedy. Michael Kennedy was a resident in Willowbrook. And when he left, he was eventually then hired by the Center on Human Policy as a trainer for self-advocates. He had a good life. He fell in love. He got married. He wanted an ice cream cone at the Baskin Robbins in Marshall Street. And there was a step. He used a wheelchair. He couldn't get in. We tried to negotiate, and we ended up having to sue. Years later, the ice cream store closed. The steps have been removed. But my point is that the ADA requires individuals to bring a lawsuit to get a remedy. And I work in other countries where maybe there are other ways to do things. And so that's one challenge of the ADA. The second challenge is, is it really getting to the ageism, I mean, to the ableism and the stigma that still attaches to disability? And I would say, no. It's helping, it's helping to raise awareness, but it certainly hasn't removed the stigma and ableism that is so prevalent in workplaces, institutions of all kinds, and society generally. Why? Because there's still a great stigma attached to people with disabilities. And there's not enough, let's say Tayshoff Center is the first, the only, right? There's not enough relationships between and among and opportunities for us to be together. In the United States, for example, there's no right to inclusive education for kids K through 12. So kids with disabilities can be still in separate classes. And people, a lot of research focuses on the problem with that, they don't get to be with kids without disabilities to learn what, quote, quote, close quote, normal life is. But there, I see another problem. I see the big problem of students without disabilities not getting to be in classrooms of kids with disabilities, because that's our world. And unless we're starting kids off with a picture of the world when they're young, how can we remove the stigma and the prejudices that they'll develop when they're older? I want to say one thing, too, about COVID, and then you'll have to tell me when to stop. I'll keep going until you do. But COVID
COVID in some ways, I mean, it's a horrible, horrible thing, but it did shine a light on many of the challenges that disabled people face every day. For those of us without disabilities, during COVID, we couldn't see our family and friends. We couldn't go to the supermarket. We couldn't take in a movie or go to the restaurant. For many people with disabilities, that's their real life. That's reality. There's no accessible transportation. There's no accessible access to restaurants or to captioning for movies. And I think that, I'm not saying I would have wanted and wished COVID on anybody, but I do see in social media and the press and generally in society that there is some awareness of the obstacles that can be created in situations like COVID, but situations where people with disabilities live all the time. And I also want to say that the other maybe benefit of COVID, if I put it in that term, um, is what Professor Myers was talking about and, and Paula about access and universal design, right? We were all sent home, teach from home. Hello, oh, okay. Teach on Zoom, okay. Record your classes, okay. Well, we've learned some things since then, right? I've always recorded my classes, I want to say, always. I've made my recordings of my classes available always to all students at all times. Just part of my commitment to universal design and learning. And now all faculty, even some faculty who oppose the idea of recording classes had no choice and they're continuing. What does that mean? That means for the one student who needs recording classes as an accommodation, they don't have to ask anymore because all the students will have access to that recording as an accommodation. I think that's so important. Those are the types of steps we have to take and those are the types of steps that really are not part of the ADA now. Um, okay, uh, you wanted me to mention something about um, the convention. So the ADA has limitations. It relies on individual lawsuits. It is very focused on employment and work settings in a way that's not creating universal design. And it really is very limited in its impact so far in eradicating ableism. So are there better models? And there are different countries do different things, but I want to use the international law, which is the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, as an example. This is a treaty. International law are treaties adopted by the United Nations. I helped to write this one during the period of 2001 to 2006 as just background legal resource information. It was written in large part by people with disabilities who came to the United Nations building from all over the world. Picture that. Picture that when you realize that there was only one elevator on the main floor of the UN where all of this meeting, all of these meetings happened. One elevator. A lot of people with different needs, wheelchairs, walkers, people who were blind, people who were deaf, trying to go from floor to floor. And what I like to say is one of the greatest benefits of this treaty is that the United Nations building had to be renovated and now has more elevators, right? But another benefit of the treaty, which by the way has been accepted and adopted by more than 185 countries in the world out of 192 and not the United States, think about that for a moment, we can discuss that, that the CRPD now has been adopted by most countries in the world and it goes further than the ADA, how? It requires inclusive education. It requires the opportunity for everyone to decide where they want to live and the resources and sources and support they need to live in the community. It requires the right of people with disabilities to make decisions about their own lives. In many cases, we have situations where people have guardians who can be very good will and good intention, but sometimes make decisions for people who would rather make decisions for themselves. This international law mandates that people with disabilities be given a chance to make decisions for themselves and get the support that they need. I can go on, there are other examples as well, but the point of this international law, I think for me, is that people with disabilities themselves, the slogan was nothing about us without us, they came to the United Nations. They didn't know how to draft language that would sound like an international law, right? So they put us to work in the back room, which was appropriate, but it was their ideas their motivation and their real lived experiences that required those changes in the law. And I want to just end by, and I'll answer questions, but I want to end by saying this, which is, I'm a law professor, right? But I want to ask you whether laws really make a difference. I'm not sure. I think they have a role to play, 
But in the end, it is up to each of us. It is up to Syracuse University. It is up to our, our neighborhoods, our religious organizations, our community organizations, but each of us individually in our hearts and our minds to open them, to be aware that we need to have each other in this world. And some of us have different abilities than we, than, than we do. And I think in the end, it's going to be up to us. And that's why I'm so thankful to be here today and that you're doing this. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor Cantor. Uh, so before we turn it over to the audience, I, I want to hit on something that was mentioned by every panelist. And that is more work to be done, right? Things left undone. And in particular, Professor Cantor, you mentioned the idea of ableism. Right in the limits of law. So, and this is for anyone who'd like to, to start off, but if I gave you a magic wand and you could change one thing, legal or non-legal, today, that would advance inclusiveness, that would fight ableism, that would allow people to live more independently, what would that be? I'm gonna make a pitch for um, really addressing stigma and ableism. Um, in the classroom, here, right? Some of the, 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 the challenges we have is that, um, that disability management, but that the pervasiveness and the hiddenness of ableism, right? By faculty, by, by individuals, able-bodied individuals who don't understand as they're creating assignments or, or um, making examples on, on um, in math tests that, that dehumanize individuals with disabilities just by the sheer antiquated examples that, that they're using. So the language, um, you know, equating students that are all, you know, that are Syracuse University students as your students versus our students, right? Um, and um, I don't have a clean cut answer for what the magic wand would be, but changing hearts and minds of faculty would be very much on top because because that is the point of which our students have contact when they're here. It's those one-on-one. -on -one. It's when um, a, a disabled student of color goes into the classroom and, um, and afraid to ask or advocate um, in terms of the believability around disability or, or um, another student in terms of disclosing a disability and then there's presumptions of competence, right? And, um, how do you address the, that social emotional level as well? Um, and I have um, struggled with trying to, to sort of figure that out and open to any suggestions in terms of how do we change culture and climate? Um, as you pointed out, Syracuse University does intentionally incorporate accessibility into our DEIA plan. Right? There is an intentionality. Our, our new vice president for um, diversity and inclusion, uh, Mary Grace Amaldres, is, is, is wonderful and transparent and open and open to learning because um, recognizing that, that coming to, to Syracuse and the, and the intentionality around disability and ableism is not something that, that uh, was readily talked about in other institutions because it's not. So we're, we're doing well in terms of having conversations, you know, but that lived experience, that experience in the classroom, that, you know, there's gaps between sort of our attentions and aspirations and, and, and the reality. Great, thank you. Any other suggestions? I was just asking you, Hans, if you had a magic wand, I'd love to hear. How would you make the world inclusive? Uh, by making the world feel and learn what I know and learn, I think, yeah. Because, I mean, if the world is able to feel what I feel, definitely uh, no one can uh, kind of discriminate me, you know. So it is really, really good uh, to, like, create awareness uh, and not teach the world now the true meaning of disability, what is in reality about disability. So I think that may make change. Thank you. And Johannes, you actually are writing in your dissertation about a systematic reform uh, in legislators that could help create better disability policy. Would you want to talk a little bit about what that topic of your dissertation is and what reform that is? Uh, yeah. I mean, 
The dissertation is all about uh, inclusive legislative representation of persons with disabilities. Uh, for example, you know, if you see, uh, we see so many like um, countries uh, allowing some minorities to uh, arrive to the, I mean, at their legislature to make their legislature, legislature inclusive and so on. But unfortunately, uh, they forget persons with disabilities. Maybe uh, when we see international human rights law and the U.S. Constitution, uh, they don't have the right to representation. I mean, they do have the right to vote. And you hear everybody now like claiming the right to vote, but we don't hear people, even persons with disabilities, claiming the right to representation, you know? Uh, I'm mentioning the right, I mean, the U.S. Constitution and uh, the international human rights law because uh, for the United States, the U.S. Constitution is the most exported product. You see? Why? Because many constitutions in the world have copied the U.S. Constitution. And many, many constitutions in the world have copied the human rights provisions of uh, the uh, Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, unfor unfortunately, b because the U.S. Constitution and the uh, Universal Declaration on Human Rights doesn't don't have the right to representation as human rights. You know, all over the world, no constitution has recognized this as human rights. You know, so uh, it remains to be political decision. I mean, for example, here in the United States, we see majority minority districts, you know, to enhance representation of blacks or um, other ethnic minorities. Even, even in many countries, you see uh, like different techniques, uh, descriptive representation to enhance representation of women, ethnic minorities. But just because this is a political decision, persons with disabilities were not able to claim, are not able to claim the right to representation, you know. Only a few countries like uh, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and Egypt have recognized in their laws uh, that persons with disabilities should be uh, represented in their legislature. Now, they have reserved some seats. But unfortunately, none of these countries is found in the West. None of these countries is found in Asia, in Latin America, you see? So, at least uh, by learning from these uh, least developed countries, I think uh, there should be a true representation of persons with disabilities in legislature, you know? Because if you place a person with disability in legislature, you, I mean, it's very, very easy to, like, to, to, to maybe remove or to fight some kind of non-inclusive laws because you are at the source of, uh, you know, these laws. So in the world, this uh, gap I see. And then, unfortunately, this political decision was not able to consider persons with disabilities because, as Professor said, you know, politics is in particular ableist. Politics is ableist, you know, and then political actors are, you know, able-minded and able-bodied. So they don't, you know, consider persons with disabilities. Uh, you can't stop me, okay? Oh, no, 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 that's good. Thank you. I, so actually, I'm going to stop you so we can turn it here from our audience. But I say, as a political scientist, I'm very excited about this idea. Uh, descriptive representation is incredibly important. And we have found that when you include groups in the legislative process, it changes what's on the agenda. It changes the types of conversations that are had. And it also changes the types of laws that are Passed. So I think this is a great idea. I just want to say, yeah. I've been so impressed and learning so much for you from Johannes as we're working together. But political scientists, where have you been? This is the first study, as we know, as far as we know, that anyone's ever looked at representation of people with disabilities in the political process. So he's going to get to it, but your field has got to move forward as well with yeah. this. Well, I, I tell you, if I had a dollar for everything political science should be looking at but isn't, uh, I'd be able to donate another wing onto this building. Uh, but thank you. So and now we're going to turn it over to the audience. And if you have a question, please raise your hand and Morgan will come give you the microphone. 
Hi, uh, my name is Sarah. I'm actually a graduate student in political science, so I'm really enjoying this aspect of the conversation. Um, one of the things that I've been sitting here thinking about is we've talked about how disability is a really large community in the United States. It's a social identity, and yet when we talk about the social identities that make up the US electorate, disability is not in that conversation, similarly to how we forget about the accessibility portion of DEIA. Um, and so I'm curious if you all have any insight into how disability is getting lost in the broader conversation, because within disability circles, there are really wonderful activists who are really making progress, and um, I don't know, I'm just really struggling with how that aspect is getting lost in the broader picture. Okay. Okay. Um, important question. And I think that's our marching orders, right? That work needs to be done. It's a great example. Disability is similar and different, though, than other social identities, even given their intersectionality, which is true of other identities as well. And so even here, for example, there are discussions about whether individuals can check as a disabled identity for themselves, and then whether that information can be shared. It, it still has presented dilemmas and questions about identity because I think that medical ableist view of disability is still there. It's like, really, do we want to treat people with disabilities as part of our electorate? Well, really? Like, what about those people who what have been... Counts. Exactly. I was going to say, what exactly how you began the conversation, who's in and who's out. I mean, go ahead. You may want to follow up. So we need education, awareness, and changing and mentalities and attitudes, but maybe that's the work that we need to do. And, yeah. So um, I think part of my research focus is really on examining critical white whiteness within disability, within our field of disability um, resource professionals. But it, it starts with um, the historical aspect in a reckoning of white supremacy in the United States and the co-constructions of both ra uh, race and disability. So part of what makes um, you know, uh, disability in terms of an identity is that if we come from a historical perspective, right, communities of color that have been marginalized, disability have became the master trope for marginalization and exclusion. Right? So if you've got um, you know century or more of this legacy of, of, of this uh, of racism and ableism and those commingling or interlocking um, histories, it becomes a really complicated conversation in terms of you know representation, right? And what does that representation look like? And and really. Um, we must be conscious of not becoming or, or engaging what we call disability essentialism, which is this understanding that a disability experience is a monolith experience because it's not, right? So when we talk about intersectionality, we're talking about um, you know, an experience that's a disabled student of color experiences disability qualitatively different right, than a white student uh, who's disabled. Right, and so, so to to have conversations, I think even within um, you know broader aspects of, of promoting disability access and inclusion, it gets complicated. I don't know if that helped answer the question at all. Only complicate the question. And, it, no, and I think that's great. part of it comes from like why is it complicated, right? Like why is why is access left out? Why are why is that not considered sort of or why is that sort of the last consideration or one of the last considerations as part of the political process or uh, you know in uh, as as an as an identity marker um, one of the things that we were just talking about is that like even in the movie Crip Camp uh, they talk about this disability hierarchy right the, um, the disability community is very fractured also um, not all disabilities are the same right who who is in? Who is out? Um, like it, they were, in that movie, they're talking about like uh, you know the the people who had polio were considered to be like uh, you know 
better than the, the people who had cerebral palsy and the people with intellectual disability are like not even present, right? So there's this whole, um, like who gets to be a, an, uh, an advocate for the disability community? Um, and um, disability pride is actually like something that's fairly new. Um, the deaf community has been doing it for a pretty long time. The autistic community has only been doing it for a few years now. And the mental health community, like, do they get to do it at all? Right? It, this is still kind of a discussion that people are having. Um, and, and it's a really great question to be thinking about, like, why? Why not? Who gets to say? Who gets to represent? And, um, and in terms of our politicians, like, what's more palatable? Like, is it palatable to have a politician in a wheelchair? Okay. Is it palatable to have a politician with a mental health issue? Right. This is the, There's a. Is it a. Is it palatable to have an autistic politician? Um, you know what. What do we accept as a society and as a culture? Um, and what would we vote for? So I think there's a. There's a lot of nuance in that. I'm just going to jump in to say we're approaching election day. So let's be vigilant, okay? Number one, if you go to any opening, you know, what do they call it? Open house with candidates. What are their policies about inclusion of people with disabilities? Ask them. What's their view on inclusive ed? What's their, what's their view of the ADA? Secondly, I show my students every year and explain it to those who may not be able to see a sign that I used to see right here in Nottingham nursing home where I vote, it's my district, there's a sign that says, if you are blind, a sign in red that says, if you are blind or can't read, please register here. <laughs> I call the commissioner every year for several years, showing them how absurd that is. That sign is no longer there, but are the, vote, are the people who are taking the ballots even trained? in terms of the rights of people with disabilities. So throughout the, throughout the electoral process and the political process, there are many places I think that we can interject our own activism, our concern, and our commitment. And we should just do it soon. So I'm going to take prerogative to ask a quick follow-up. Uh, I'm fascinated by the idea you mentioned of a hierarchy among disability activist groups. And I think about parallels between LGBTQ activism um, and the hierarchy within that group as well. Are there examples of successful coalitions that have been made among activist groups or with activist groups and other civil rights organizations that have produced gains that can be a model? Sure. You, I know you might have had some notes on this. I don't want to steal it from you, Paula. But uh, you know, this was a this was a big deal in the uh, right in the in sort of the the birth of the disability rights movement. Right. The the um, the uh, disability, the disabled activists um, were were hugely supported by the civil rights movement, um, and used the civil rights movement as an example. And in fact, were uh, supported in a lot of their protests by the Black Panthers. So, um, you know, there were coalitions that were built among activist communities. Granted, that was the '60s, right? Like, <laughs> there were all sorts of things happening in the '60s, but. I think um, you know some of those coalitions were were really important, um, critical to the to the movements. Um, but also, some of those movements experienced some of the same sort of fits and starts that uh, that that that, um, that happened kind of across the movements, right? That that happened with the civil rights movement. Um, similarly to the civil rights movement that also happened with the disability rights movement, which was, um, you know, they would get a gain and then that gain might be uh, partial or on paper and then not really enacted or enacted but um, not really enforced, uh, just very similar to, uh, right, we have all kinds of uh, laws around inclusive education that are not fully enacted in our schools, very similar to how uh, school segregation is not legal, but de facto segregation happens every day in our school system. So I think a lot of these 
uh, a lot of these movements intersect. Yeah. Can you give you a current example, which is during the Black Lives Matter movement, which is ongoing, shall we say, um, there was a lot of research done that showed that the majority, and I, I don't have the number in front of me, but 80%, the majority of black people who were killed by police had a disability. And that provoked discussions among the Black Lives Movement um, communities and disability communities, of which they are both a part because black people have disabilities and disabled people can be black or white. So that movement, and it's still, I, I you know I, we spend a class session on that in my disability law class, and people are kind of surprised. Um, but there's more and more, more and more um, relationships trying to develop over issues of police treatment of people with disabilities and people who are uh, of color, for example. And I think that's ongoing now, actually. For the prison population, and the disability prison, and exactly. race. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Brian, it was uh, somewhat unusual that you were in policy leadership positions Brian, it was somewhat unusual that you were in policy leadership positions, as the professor said, right after the 60s, but at a time where a lot of individuals with physical disabilities were put into particular kinds of positions. How did you advocate for yourself so that you would have a leadership position and people would see that within the policy area and not as a function of your lived experience with a physical disability? Well, I, um, I became chief of staff of an assemblyman and he, because I was chief of staff, he quickly became known as a disabled advocate. And I would give him issues that we should look into. And he would introduce it into the house for debate. And so a lot of it is to educate the person who, and they have to pick up the issue as their issue. And I could give them all the information he needed. But he had to carry the ball. So I had all the um, benefits of the being a member without having to run for office, <laughs> you know. And so um, that's it's, you have to know, you have to know who you know. That's the other thing. Know who you know. And so, who owes the keys to the kingdom of whatever issue you want? And oftentimes, it isn't the person that you think it is. It's, it could be a number two or number three person on somebody's staff. They could hold the issue up. And so they have to take a lot of searching, you know, to find who that person is. And, and some, it's very important to do that. Hello? Hello? Uh, very nice panel. I'm really happy to see all the prominent uh, leaders of disability community in our university. I have just a suggestion, maybe it could be a proposal. Uh, I come from a more international perspective of disability, like mostly connected to what Professor Cantor mentioned, UN conventions. So uh, I was thinking all the discussions, like all the history, all the challenges have been discussed here. These are the problems that many other countries outside the US are far behind. So many things are, have, have been solved here, but many other countries still so behind. So US has a lot of experience. It could be very important internationalization of disability expertise of the Syracuse University, working more closely with other countries. For instance, like Maxwell School has a strong presence in a different country. Like we have Moynihan Institute working in different parts of the world, and international relations program. And I, I think, honestly, these programs are not doing enough to bring the disability research scholarship advocacy of the U.S. to those countries. That could be some missed opportunity that can be, I think, still fixed. If, uh, you know, you all and I know other professors, faculty could closely work with Maxwell in uh, doing so. I would be happy to be part of this process. Thank you very much.
Hey, thank you. So, um, so if I can ask, what can universities do to foster connections internationally and to advocate for some of the programs here elsewhere? Yeah. I'll give an example. Um, I don't know how many years ago, I was successful in approaching Open Society, the Soros Foundation, in their higher education program in disability to support funding to bring lawyers from around the world to different law schools, starting with ours, um, to study here for a year or two to receive their LLM, their advanced degree in law, and study comparative disability law policy. This is our 10th year now doing that program, and because of the success, we started the SJD program. And Johannes is one of our SJD students. But I want to tell you the ripple effect of that has been enormous. Our LLM graduates now are working in Geneva with UN committees. They're working in Kenya right, uh, as part of the government, writing their education law. I can go on. Every one of those students who came have gone back to their home countries and are making a difference in their laws, policies, and practices around disability. And why aren't we doing more? So Open Society no longer has that program. We are committed at the law school to continue to bring lawyers from around the world to participate in our program. But why should it just be the LLM? It should be every master's program throughout, not just political science, right? Every department. We should be bringing people here to expose them to our courses, and then we should be following up with opportunities to work with them in their countries. Um, and I would happily work on a proposal like that for you. I think it's something that we owe to the world, frankly, and the way that we can give back to the many things that we've learned and received here. Thanks. All right, any other questions? Yes. Can I something? Yes, Just please. Just to add on what Professor said, you know, uh, uh, not only even in Kenya, because in my country, Ethiopia, uh, me and uh, other f three uh, blind students were, were able to attend, you know, Syrac University because of the OSF scholarship. And to your surprise, uh, after we went back home, you know, uh, we like uh, started, you know, to make some laws inclusive. Uh, for example, uh, me personally, I drafted, uh, inclu I mean, access to copyright law. Have you ever heard about Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published work for persons with visual impairment and print disability? Yeah, uh, Ethiopia, my country, uh, was able to ratify this treaty uh, two years before. That means after my graduation from Syracuse University, you know. So uh, with the help, um, with the help of or in collaboration with uh, Ethiopia National Association for the Blind, using the, the, the knowledge I got from Syracuse University, you know, I was able to give successive trainings on access to copyright law for parliament members. And then these members you know, were able to ratify Marrakesh Treaty very, very easily because that treaty has so many issues regard, regarding copyright law. And then to enforce this treaty, there should be kind Kind of a statute, you know. So then they want a person, they want, you know, some kind of experts, you know, to draft this law. And fortunately, I was a person who was chosen to draft the law uh, with uh, 13 articles, no, 14 articles. It was a very wonderful law. Now we are pushing the parliament to ratify that law. We are also now. Um, ratifying a comprehensive disability law modeling uh, ADA. So this is definitely the impact of Syracuse University to add this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, yes. Yeah, um, I would just like to thank the distinguished panel for uh, an amazing conversation. And I'm also a member of the international community, so I can attest that Syracuse University is reaching its hands. Uh, I'm from Poland, and Syracuse University and Professor Cantor and Professor Cora Trufrost have been instrumental in facilitating the exchange, the know-how that we really need. So I really wanted to thank you. And I also wanted to ask whether there, ha uh, there have been any efforts made on account of um, 
maybe civil society has already taken care of that, but maybe there are any processes, and I'm thinking about uh, restorative justice practices or um, negotiations that are out of court um, methods of resolving disputes. And also on an international level, perhaps there have been any um, truth and reconciliation commissions regarding disability. So I just, in a nutshell, whether civil society has also um, resolved that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to uh, great question. Um, again, these are, I mean, it's so interesting because these are, this is the next frontier. This is what has to be happening. And I know that there are law review articles coming up about that, and there's research going on. Um, maybe you want to become involved in some of that research. But there are definitely discussions, and the CRPD committee, which is every treaty has a committee that's appointed to implement the, tre the treaty and to review country reports. And the CRPD committee has raised this among it themselves, is how they can expand some of the established processes within the international law system, which is pretty clearly defined at this point to allow for truth reconciliation trainings and things like that. So it, you're, it's, a, it's the hot issue. It's a very timely question um, and something that you may want to be looking at as even a student here, writing papers and doing research to get the word. And people know it's just alternative to litigation, ways of, di of resolving disputes without having courts involved, which is often preferable. It's a hot issue in education too, right? Because we know there's like an over punishment of children with disabilities and also children of color, right? So it's that, they call it the school to prison pipeline, right? So it's uh, putting kids into disciplinary practices it's, and it's heavily weighted on, on kids with disabilities and kids of color. So thinking about those restorative justice practices uh, is it's much needed in the school process as well. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, then before we give a big round of applause to the panel, I'd like to make some special thanks. Uh, first to George and Kathy Hicker for endowing the professorship in the speaker series, which made this possible, and for all their great work on disability and access here at Syracuse University. I'd like to thank the Dean's Office and the support of Dean Van Slyke, uh, Morgan Bicknell for organizing and promoting, Tom Fazio doing his wizard with uh, all the IT work and uh, just uh, a special thanks to one of the inspirations for the panel, uh, Parker Schuler. So uh, after this event, there's going to be uh, food and drink uh, back. So please uh, go ahead and take advantage of that. And please join me in giving a round of applause to our panel.